Watching the Law News Network, we were playing back some of the defense closing arguments in the Frank Bybee case out of Sarasota County, Florida. Our next guest is here to talk not only about that case, but an upcoming case we're covering next week, the Jessica Chambers case out of Mississippi. Troy Slayton is a Law News guest. He's an attorney in California. Troy, good to see you again here on Law News. Thanks for having me back. So uh, let's talk about this Bybee case out of Florida here. It seems like a real he said, she said to me, because uh, maybe it's just because the lawyering has been so strong on either side. You know, the one version of it is that this officer came over to help out this woman, and, and maybe she was a little bit of a nasty old lady who uh, really was uh, demanding because of the way some of her neighbors have classified her. And maybe he sort of went along with a little bit too much. and. It stuck him in a position to be under her thumb and for her to accuse him of all sorts of nasty things. Uh, that's the defense side of it. You know, the state is saying, hey, look, no, this officer overstepped the boundaries, was preying on this woman and then tried to off her when he realized the thing was unraveling. And he tried to do so in a way that would have looked like a suicide, not like an outright murder. And who else would have better known how to do that but someone who was a sheriff's deputy? So. It seems like, as I said, a real he said, she said. The defense team here has a great opportunity from a defense perspective to really paint the victim here, the alleged victim, in a, a real unsavory light. It appears that she's had uh, at least one stint in a, a mental health facility. So credibility of a witness, especially the complaining victim, is always of paramount importance. And if the defense is able to paint this as a crazy old lady, then that can score a lot of points with the jury. Yeah, I mean, now, of course, the he said, she said kicks in there because he, the defendant, says it doesn't matter whether I suggested or whether I was involved in this. The doctors are the ones who committed her. The state says the doctors wouldn't have committed her but for the fake emails he was sending out in their view of things from her account. So again, there are certainly arguments on either side for the jury to bat back and forth in the jury room. Absolutely, but uh, aside from both the victim and the defendant, we have uh, a next door neighbor who says that this is a, a crazy, nasty old lady and at several, at least on several occasions, had said that this police officer was better than ice cream. So yeah, I know that was one of the most bizarre quotes to come out of this, but I remember it. Um, you know, of course, I'm sure that, that uh, some health food person out there would say there are plenty of things better than ice cream, but that's beside the point. Um, you know, so again, which, which side does the jury believe here? Who knows? You never know what a, a jury's going to do. Uh, clearly, this officer was in the wrong in getting so involved with uh, a subject, somebody that he met as a result of a call for service to her residence. So the fact that he was uh, having such an intimate uh, relationship with her, whether it be sexual, personal, or whatever it was, uh, he was in the wrong for that, and it really just led him down a wrong path. Whether that means that he tried to kill her is a whole other story because, I mean, this is a, a, a police officer who's trained in defensive and offensive uh, maneuvers, and we're talking about an 80-year-old lady. If he tried to kill her, I mean, he'd be able to do it. Well, yeah, you know, people have said that bottom line. If, if he wanted to kill her, he wasn't going to make it look like he's the one that killed her. He was going to make it look like a suicide, which is exactly what, if, if we're to believe the state's theory, he did with these attempts, forcing her to swallow pills. Well, what would the evidence be? The accusation is, is that he had gloves on so as not to leave marks, things like that. He's not going to leave marks because then if it had gone off the way the state theorizes, they would have looked and said, mm, something's not right about this. She's got injuries. You right. know, well, I mean, what caused those injuries? He's going to, if, if he indeed was going to do it, if he indeed did it, he would have done it the way that the state is saying he did it, forcing pills down her throat or, uh, you know, I say forcing because if you force too hard, there's going to be signs of an injury. OK, leaving the car running. These are classic ways people commit suicide, pills, running cars in garages. So maybe this does fit the state's case. 
she said something really interesting. She said that she was waiting to see the uh, the white light that you expect to see when you're about to uh, meet your maker. And if he was choking her to such a degree that she thought she was about to die, I mean, albeit she is an elderly woman, uh, there would be marks, whether they're whether he's wearing gloves or not. Uh, you you leave ligature marks, whether or not there's a DNA transfer. That's what's gonna, what gloves are going to stop. But gloves aren't going to stop marks from being found on somebody's neck's uh, neck as a result of an attempted strangulation. Yeah, true, true. You know, and we have the photos from the state, which the state alleges are signs of, of this injury sort of slowly, you know, coming to be. But the neighbor says she didn't look like she was injured at all. Is there any way to put the two stories together? Well, one of the instructions that's given to a jury is if you find that there's two reasonable uh, uh, ways to interpret a piece of evidence, one of them points to innocence and one of, them's, one of them points to guilt, you must, you're required to adopt that which points to innocence. It's, it's what's known as the circumstantial evidence uh, instruction. And uh, that's told to jurors all the time. So if they, if, if by looking at that evidence, it could lead the jurors down a path of guilt or a path of innocence, they must, as long as it's reasonable, adopt the interpretation that points to innocence. Yeah, you know, I, I have to wonder about that. You know, I'm not a scientist as far as understanding injuries, but look, if I bump myself on the table when I walk out the door, it doesn't bruise immediately. I notice the bruise later. Is it possible to take this neighbor's version of things and say, uh, well, the victim, the alleged victim, didn't look like she was injured, and then later the injury started to manifest as a bruise would if I slam myself into the door frame on the way out the door. Well, that's a completely reasonable explanation, and that's what the uh, prosecutor, I'm sure, is trying to pound into the, the heads of the jurors. Yeah, uh, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that. Uh, it's possible that the neighbor didn't notice the injuries, but that they became more visible by the time the police showed up, depending on the time frame here. But we didn't hear a lot of evidence like that. It was just sort of left to the jury to connect the dots on that, at least from, from what I've seen. And that's a problem for the prosecutors, because uh, when there's gaps in the case, that's the exact type of thing that jurors can hang their hat on with regard to uh, a finding of not guilty. And so jurors, when they go back into that jury room and they're deliberating, they take their job very seriously. They want to do the right thing. And I think that when applying the facts to the law, uh, they're going to look for things like that. Why wouldn't the uh, police investigators have a picture from the next day and the day after that and the day after that when we could see exactly how uh, bruises, if any, developed over time? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that. I don't think it was as fully developed in evidence as it, it could have been. But uh, at the end of the day, our previous guests seemed to think that it's going to be easy for the jury to reach this sort of preying on the elderly charges. There's computer uh, charges. There are a series of charges related to the money, the computer use, uh, the fact that the defendant is an older, or excuse me, the victim is an older woman. You see her there uh, getting assistance from a couple of other people in court at the uh, either, it looks like the conclusion of her testimony. But, um, you know, is it possible that the jury is going to reach some of these lower charges and say, hey, look, we, we're not comfortable with this relationship? but that the jury's not gonna reach that top attempted murder charge. Absolutely, and I think jurors really like to do that all the time, especially if they get an icky feeling about the defendant. They, they'll they be more than happy to uh, what we call, in, in legal terms, split the baby. Hmm. And and they're happy to uh, find, if they, if they think this guy was bad, he seems like he was a dirty cop. He seems like he was trying to mess with her. But we also don't believe everything that she's saying because she's kind of crazy. Let's convict him on some of these lesser charges and, uh, and, and acquit him on the more serious charge of attempted murder. Well, and it also goes back to beyond reasonable doubt, too. I mean, I'm relatively convinced that I'm not cool with the way that this relationship, whatever it was, was going on here. But the attempted murder charge, I don't know if they've got it beyond a reasonable doubt because you know, part of me wonders, okay, well, maybe she is a little bit crazy. Maybe she is making up some of this stuff. Maybe 
this uh, attack wasn't uh, as, as harsh as she claimed it was. Maybe I believe a little bit of the neighbor. And when I start throwing all that together, I have to just stop myself and say, well, then I'm not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that it went down as an attempted murder. Well, like they always say, there's uh, his version, her version, and somewhere in the middle is the truth. So uh, who knows? Um, but uh, sometimes jurors uh, acquit when they should convict. Sometimes they convict when they should acquit. You never know what they're going to do. Um, but unless they feel not just you know beyond a reasonable doubt, but to the exclusion of any reasonable doubt. I like to tell jurors that they have to be 100% free of reasonable doubt in order to convict. And uh, if, if they don't find that the evidence meets, then they're not going to uh, vote in favor of the state with regard to that attempted murder charge. Yeah, the jury's had the case since earlier today, so I'm really curious to see where this goes. Uh, I've not yet heard how late they're going to deliberate. Part of me always uh, wants to say that they may wrap this up today because they don't want to drag it into another work week, but we don't know yet. Sometimes they do drag things into another week. Well, as a defense attorney, I hate giving a case to a jury on a Friday afternoon because I don't want them to be worried about having to come back into court on Monday and uh, having some jurors just capitulate in order to be done with it. I mean, these jurors have been taken away from their families, their work, their everyday lives. They're, uh, on the one hand, know that they're doing their civic duty, but on the other hand, people try and get out of jury duty for a reason. Uh, they don't like it. They're being paid, what, 15, 20 bucks a day uh, they don't want to be doing this. And the last thing they want to do is come back on Monday. Yeah, I'm waiting to see when we're going to get a verdict, if we're going to get one today or how late they will deliberate. So we'll be back with the Bybee case here uh, when it comes back. But I also want to ask you, Troy, about this Mississippi versus Quentin Tillis case, which is the case that we're going to be covering starting next week. A lot of people are calling it the Jessica Chambers case. She's the victim. 19 died uh, perhaps the most horrible death one can possibly imagine uh, doused him. with gasoline burns over 98 percent of her body she survives until the next day and finally expires in the hospital so uh, she must have been in in the most excruciating of circumstances um, with that coverage is going to begin next week here on law news uh, we're going to be there gavel to gavel in mississippi for the case got a 28 year old defendant he's got a rap sheet there's some allegations that he's got some gang connections. Um, he's also wanted uh, as being charged in uh, another death, the, the death of a 34-year-old woman, a stabbing death, different kind of crime being alleged. But uh, what do you make of this one? Uh, it's, it's a strange case. Uh, nobody saw the actual crime occur this young man admitted that he was with her earlier in the day uh, and he's also uh, not a good guy in that he's been convicted in another state and uh, he was actually extradited back to uh, this state in order to stand trial on these charges so uh, I don't think that the jurors are going to know anything about what he was convicted of uh, elsewhere because that would be unduly prejudicial. But uh, this is a horrific case where the victim uh, burned over 98 percent of her body and lived for hours after being found. It's a horrific, horrific crime. But I haven't seen anything uh, as far as an explanation as to why. Now, prosecutors don't have to prove motive. But jurors really like to hear that. Oh, they certainly do. And part of me wonders what's going on here. I mean, is it something that's just evil or was something else going on here, too? You know, there's there's uh, accusations. Maybe he was trying to get it or, or credit cards or something like that. But I mean, talk about it. If that's the case, talk about a dumb criminal. I mean, those things can be traced. You know, I mean, it's, it's not free money walking around on a card. They can get traced. There are flawed, flawed alerts. I mean, heck, if I if I buy something in another state that I'm traveling through, it'll it'll shut mine down half the time, even though it's really me trying to make the purchase. You know, we all have that happen to us. So, um, you know, but yet he does admit that he was in some kind of a relationship with the victim. It, it, it sounds from what I understand to have been a relatively new one. We don't from my research yet know how they met. 
uh, there's been some accusations, maybe it was online, but that from what I understand is still speculation at this point. Apparently they did go to the same high school, I've heard that. So, uh, you know, they were in some kind of a fledgling relationship, um, but it, it sounds as if it were relatively new, and beyond that, he admits to have, being, uh, have been with her the, the day that she was attacked, but nothing beyond that. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to figure this out as well. Uh, as a juror and as a defense attorney, I would really want to know uh, if any other evidence was found. She was doused uh, along with her car with some sort of accelerant, uh, some sort of flammable liquid. And I want to know, was that found on him or any of his clothes or any of his belongings? Um, was there was there some other reason other than maybe just wanting to get her her credit card numbers, which is what he was convicted of in the other state? He yeah. allegedly in that other state stabbed uh, a person uh, multiple times in order to get that person's pin number for their debit card. Yeah. So how does this play back and forth between Mississippi and uh, I believe the other state is Louisiana? How does it play back and forth here? I mean, we know the general rule, Troy, that one case doesn't play into another one unless there's some kind of mode of opportunity or other other issue that would link them. And oftentimes, even then, the defense will be objecting left and right. Some of it has to ha has a bit of a root in the confrontation clause that you can only be tried for a crime once. If you commit a crime over here and commit a crime over there, um, you have to be tried for each one separately because you can't be retried for the same crime more than once. So, right. you know, we've got that going on. But beyond that, I'm expecting that a lot of the facts are going to come out in the trial because we don't know a lot about this beyond the core facts that, that came out early on. Yeah, we don't. And the, the prosecutor is... is playing at mum as well as defense counsel at this point. So I, I really don't know what the defense is going to be. As far as the facts of the other case, you said the Tennessee case, I think that's where it was. Um, yeah, normally those those things are not admissible because the danger of unfair prejudice um, substantially outweighs any probative value from that other case, unless they can show some sort of, like you said, habit or routine, if they can show that this is what he always did. But the facts of the other case are so different. That's that's a case involves, involving a stabbing. This is a case involving uh, a lighting somebody on, on fire, so, uh, immolation, I think is the, the term for it. And it's... Um, it's, it's a pretty horrific crime, but hopefully the jury won't be compelled to convict just based on the heinous nature of the crime and wanting to hold somebody responsible and, uh, and actually on the facts as they're presented here. We have a jury being sequestered from 200 miles away. They're being bussed. They're sequestered for two weeks. What does that tell you? That tells me that the defense counsel was successful in uh, complaining to the or arguing to the uh, judge that they couldn't get a fair trial because it's such a small town and everybody knows each other. And the only way to secure a, a jury that would be able to um, judge the facts independently and fairly and without bias or prejudice would be from bringing them in from somewhere else. And we're going to see that when jury selection starts this Monday. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that the voir dire gets through any uh, issues because, again, it, it's, uh, it's a sequestered jury from 200 miles away. But Mississippi uh, is not a huge state and uh, news still spreads. It, it does. But hopefully uh, we'll get jurors who uh, take their job very seriously and can put aside any of their passions and prejudices and any information that they've learned outside the courtroom and just judge the case on the information presented in the courtroom. I mean, that's the ideal. That's what we hope. And that's what the voir dire process uh, is for. Well, that's what we hope. And, you know, we said before, you said before, and I agree, we, we don't know a lot beyond the core fact. It may be because the state has not a lot to play with. They may have some threads that they think pile up uh, to, to go beyond probable cause, obviously. But it's possible that the state doesn't have a ton of facts, uh, or it's possible that, uh, as you said, the state is playing things close to the vest, and there's nothing wrong with that. 
that prevents well, think, the jury from being prejudiced. Well, one thing that would um, lead me to believe that they don't have a, a solid open and shut case is that they weren't they're not seeking the death penalty in this case. They decided uh, that they would seek uh, life without possibility of parole if he's convicted. And the fact that they're not seeking the death penalty means that they may not have what they feel is a slam dunk case. Yeah, Troy, I, just recently we obtained uh, the state's witness list for this particular case, and I'm just getting my first look at it now. We've got a lot of people on here from the local fire department probably who were who responded to the uh, scene. We have EMS workers. We've got a couple of people from the sheriff's office. Uh, it looks like a relative of the victim. A lot of the people on the witness list are from the fire department. Uh, we've got a few, uh, looks like doctors who probably treated uh, the victim in this case. Uh, not a horrendously long list, but it, it's rather exhaustive. Uh, there are a couple of expert witnesses here. We've got somebody from the ATF probably to talk about the type of accelerant used, uh, the, the crime lab that tested, that tested uh, what was used here. Uh, got a couple of, uh, we've got a couple of cell phone people here from AT&T and Verizon, uh, and a couple of other laboratory people, but um, also someone from the U.S. Attorney's Office, that's interesting, FBI District Office, a lot of law enforcement, a lot of local first responders on that list. So that leads me to believe that the the prosecution case in chief is very heavy as to the heinous nature of the crime, how terrible it was. Um, all, all the they're, they're, we're going to hear exhaustively from the EMS workers, from the firemen, from the first responders about this horrific scene where they find this woman with burns over 98 percent of her body and the the horrific nature of that and. As a defense attorney, that would make me think that, you know, when when the law is on your side, you argue the law. When the facts are on your side, you argue the facts. And when neither the law nor the facts are on your side, you just make a lot of noise and uh, try and uh, tug at the heartstrings of these jurors. Does this concern you in any way? Well, does what part of it? I mean, the part that the, the witnesses all seem to be people that can't really tell us who it was that did it? Well, more or less. I mean, I, I asked a question and you, you answered it by asking another question, but it was an answer wrapped up in a question. So, uh, you know, I, I just I just wonder, you know, look, we all get the we all know there's a jury instruction in every state where I've ever been. And I'm assuming Mississippi has it that tells the jury, look, you can't decide the case based on sympathy for the victim or emotion. And so when I and, and look, I mean, I, I take flack when I say this, but when I see cases built on that, I start to get a little bit nervous. I get a little bit queasy because, of course, we're going to feel sorry for the victim. I mean, nobody's going to look at this and say, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's not a horrible death. I mean, everybody's going to look at it and say it's a horrible death. I, I, of course, feel sorry for the victim. But, and again, maybe this just is the way my brain thinks, but I, I have learned I have to separate that from the question as to whether or not the particular defendant sitting in the chair is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I, I've really had to force myself to divide my brain in half and, and separate one from the other. And look, a and am, I, am I evil for doing that? I don't think you're evil for doing that at all. And one thing that we can't ignore, I, I believe, and I wish that this wasn't something that we have to discuss, and it's really the 800-pound gorilla uh, in the room, and that's race. Uh, we've got Mississippi. We've got a, a white um, victim, and we've got a, a black defendant. And Mississippi has a, a storied history uh, with regard to race. And in any case like that, uh, like this, it comes up. And it's, it, it's easy for us as legal experts to think that everything is decided on the facts and the law, but that's just not reality. You're correct. Um, I am, am very hesitant to go there because uh, perhaps it, it's that I, I hope that we've moved past that as a society, although I recognize that we haven't. Uh, but I hope, I, so hope, I hope that the voir dire process deals with this. I hope the peremptory strikes deal with this. 
that's my hope. So I'm, I'm reserving judgment on that because I would hate to stereotype uh, a perfectly fine jury who's going to look at the case uh, correctly. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm going I'm to sort of wait and see what we find out about who's on the jury, uh, you know, how they're paying attention to the evidence uh, before I kind of go down there. But I, I, I will agree with you, Troy, that uh, it's something that I'm taking a look at. Uh, but beyond that, I'm not forming opinions about it yet. So, um, you know, bottom line is we, we've got this sequestered jury. We don't know who's ultimately going to be on it. We don't know the gender makeup of the jury yet. We don't know the racial makeup of the jury yet. Um, and uh, I don't even know where they're going to be brought in from. 200 miles is a, a decent distance. So we still have a lot to think about with this case. We will be covering it here on Law News next week. Uh, Troy, good to have you back on Law News. Certainly uh, appreciate your viewpoint. Did your automatic lights in your office go out? I think out? it did. There, <laughs> there, there we are. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you've got them on a sensor. You're more technologically advanced than we are. So um, I, got the, I got it back, though. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Thanks a lot, Troy. We'll see you again. Nice seeing you.